thanks very much, Deb, for your time. And uh, we've really been looking forward to this. So I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Don. Uh, it's a little bit odd. I'm in Zoom. Uh, welcome to my my office. And uh, yeah, I'm staring at two computer screens with no people on it. So I will try to take that space and imagine you guys out there and in uh, your space. I know I know pro probably a lot of you. Anyways, my talk today is about tiny bubbles and I'm referring to tiny social bubbles and to resilient systems, which I'm talking about resilient social and ecological systems. Uh, but before I start, when someone wants to solve a complex problem, which for me professionally and for the purposes of this presentation is to find better ways um, of moving forward on stewardship of e ecosystems and sustainable development of natural resources. It's key to consider one's observational standpoint, or for me, my viewpoint, which most of the time was from the seat of my bicycle. Um, I think it has a lot to do with um, learning to solve problems better by considering our own viewpoints. And I'll just say up front that I think multiple points of view and solving complex problems is um, essential for us to figure out um, our way out of some of the things that I'm gonna talk about today. So for my viewpoint, uh, whoops, uh, I started my career in the, the Kutsmatina and I went there as a volunteer and that's where I realized what my calling was, which was to go back to school and be a wildlife ecologist. So um, that's, that's where I started. And from there, I went to Tweedsmere Provincial Park, uh, working on a grizzly bear study there for a few years. And then I went up to Avavik National Park which was the first um, lands claim settlement for a co uh, for um, the Anuvialui in the northern Yukon, and it's a, a Ivavik National Park is in the northern Yukon, and it's a co-managed park. So that's the first of its kind, and the Kutsmatin was the first of its kind for um, a park, actually the only of its kind that was designated specifically for the conservation of grizzly bears. So even though um, I loved tromping around and bushwhacking in that country in the Kutsmatin, even I can't go back into the, the main part of the park to uh, ever visit it again, but it's precious in my memory. Uh, from there, I went to uh, the Northern Wolverine Project, which is here on the left. Eric and I are trying to get the plane warmed up to go out for a telemetry flight. And um, it was here after several, well, what would that be? Almost a decade of, of wilderness and park related studies. It was here that was my first um, integration into um, full on natural resource, uh, industrialized uh, natural resource extraction. And it was also here in the time that I was going back to the Kluani National Park, that the spru mountain, spru or mountain, not mountain pine beetle, but spruce beetle was taking off in Kluani National Park. So you can see the red forest in the top photo there. And that's when I was working there. And these were my first real glimpses, although I was learning about it in university and through my earlier work about climate change, these were my first real glimpses of climate change. And at that time in uh, Kluani National Park in the top right, the, the beetle was taking off throughout the park quite rapidly. And then in the early 2000s, uh, a scientist, a climate scientist contacted me and others of us that were working in Avavik National Park and asked us for our photos of the first or the farthest north trees that we had been seeing in the early 1990s, mid 1990s. And this is a photo of Stefan and I uh, um, standing beside what we thought were the furthest north trees. And they took some of those photos and that's when they were first looking into tree line moving farther north and um, shrublands moving farther north. And since then, that landscape has been totally transformed. I haven't been back there uh, since the early 2000s, but I've read about and seen photos of it and the Arctic, like probably most of you know, is warming much faster than we are here. So I look back on my career and I can see that um, 
that all of the study areas, every single one of them that I've worked in, and that's quite a lot in BC, um, a few in the Yukon and one in Alaska, has been transformed in some way, either directly through resource extraction. So on the left here um, on this Wolverine project, it was my first time I had seen industrial, the might and might of, of what I would call gold rush development. There were two logging companies working, a mining company, and they were putting 380 kilometers of hydro line in when I first went there. So I had seen glimpses of this before in Vancouver Island where I grew up and in Terrace Kitimat Valley where I grew up, where I was watching um, forests be uh, liquidated of their old growth um, in a very fast period of time. And I also saw the follow in friends and family losing jobs in their forest related businesses. And when I was in Tweetsmere National Park, uh, we were at meetings uh, as, as biologists talking with the community about what um, how they were going to manage when the, um, Interfor moved out of the Bellacoola Valley because they knew they only had, if I remember right, it was five or ten years left of, of what they thought was um, um, harvesting to happen. So I've seen conservation at its finest and I've seen industrial development at its worst. Um, so in 2014, Lotar retired and we had long been talking about doing a bicycle trip uh, of the Americas and we wanted to go from our home to Ushuaia in the southern part of uh, South America. And he told me that he was going with or without me. <laughs> uh, he needed to go and he felt that uh, time was not going to wait for us. And so I was just, I was just completing um, what I thought was an extraordinarily important project, but it was severely underfunded for the Babine Watershed Monitoring Trust. And it was a monitoring land use plan to maintain grizzly bears in the Babine River watershed. I only did a partial analysis, but I spent a long time working on it. And quite frankly, I was shocked by what I discovered. Um, I had been involved in the Babine doing some radio collar grizzly bear work, and I had done some bear viewing um, related work for parks. Uh, so I, I knew the history, some of the history of the land use planning, but I didn't know all of it. And when I took on the project, I thought it would take me a few weeks, and instead it took me a few years that I tried to do on the side of my plate with other things that I was working on. But anyway, so the long and the short of it is that I wrote the report, it's a long report, and I presented it to people in industry, to government, to, um, well, actually at the BV Research Center, that was the last presentation I gave to the center um, not long before I left on this trip. And then on June 2015, somehow I managed to pack up my office and my life and get on my bicycle, and I pedaled out of Smithers, fretting about climate change, loss of biodiversity and serious threats to uh, species at risk. And to top that all off, I was fretting about leaving my community at a time where I thought it was really important that I be here as a professional working um, in the natural resource development field, related field, and, and specifically um, in stewardship of ecosystems. And the reason I was fretting so much was because I was following closely the environmental assessment process and the, all of the pipelines that were in the process and mines that were in the process and other major projects. And it was at a time when resources were being cut for government or for professionals to, uh, to help in the problem solving for these uh, developments. And it was also at a time where there was reorganizations going on. Uh, there was deregulation of environmental assessments and we sorely needed a cumulative effects process. So I left here, quite frankly, <laughs> exhausted, dejected, demoralized, and right now I'm feeling a little emotional. And uh, Lothar, when he left, I heard him talking to a friend on the telephone and he said, when he left that he wanted to be like a leaf fluttering in the wind. 
and I went out like a spider with my thread firmly attached to home and I was going to make this trip into something that I could bring home to my community. So what I learned was that development and globalization, our current model of development and globalization disconnects social and ecological systems. I've known this for a long time, in fact, probably for almost the entire course of my career, but this bicycle ride underscored this in spades. We waste and we pollute, we destroy and we degrade ecosystems. It's unsustainable. And what we're left with is a fragile biosphere. And thanks to Greta Thunberg, she said things eloquently in a few words that uh, reveal some big truths that um, many of us are coming to terms with. So while I was riding, fortunately, um, in 2009, uh, there's some folks that started talking about planetary boundaries. And I actually never discovered these until um, when I was riding, maybe somewhere around 2017. And it was helpful for me to, to kind of uh, hone my, my thoughts and my efforts into where I wanted to focus on this journey and what I wanted to learn about. So the planetary boundaries that have been identified, and this is just a conceptual model, is biosphere integrity. Um, they're telling us, the estimate, current estimates right now is that our genetic diversity is at high risk and they don't know about the functional diversity. So the diversity of, of structures and processes in, in, in the biosphere. Climate change, we've got increasing risk, and we all know that this is increasing rapidly. Biogeochemical flows, uh, nitrogen cycles and phosphorus cycles are at high risk. These are to do with agriculture. Land system change, increasing risk. Water use, they're estimating is safe at this point. Ocean acidification is still within a safe range, although that's changing and stratosphere ozone depletion is considered in a safe range, although that's um, changing as well. And atmospheric aerosol loading. And novel entities, they don't know. And novel entities are things like, things that we make or create artificially, like um, chemicals, or not chemicals, but plastics and things like that. So uh, the last reference here is from Planetary Boundaries Guiding Human Development on a Changing Planet, and that's from 2015. So I'm glad I discovered that. Um, I focused more on, or I left thinking I was focusing on, on um, biodiversity and climate change, and I had planned to blog about it, but I spent more time researching than blogging. And um, both of those were obvious to me, big problems when I left home, and, and these folks I'm grateful for, for making it a little bit more concise in how we think about it. It's just a conceptual model. There are still debates about things like the biodiversity and how they're, they're assessing that and analyzing that, but they're moving forward slowly, a step at a time, to make it better. It's a good start. Um, oops. Why is it not going forward? Hmm. Do I still have you done? Oh. Hello. I'm still here, Dan. Okay. Sorry, I didn't hear anybody. That's okay. I think okay. we've all got our mute on just so we don't. Um... Yeah, okay, that's good. I can't go past this. <laughs> okay. And, and uh, this, you know, I might sound to be saying a lot of heavy stuff, but I actually have to say right now that I'm inspired by the things that I, I'm seeing happening at higher levels and at really um, integrated um, transdisciplinary levels. But all of this time throughout the course of my career, the climate change, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has been working on helping to inform us about climate change. It was founded in 1988. I started my work in 1990. 
uh, they've produced the fifth assessment report, which I think most of you know, and there's three working group reports and a synthesis report and 2013 and 2014. So that was just before I left. Uh, um, they're great reports. I recommend if you've never looked at them directly, they have summaries for uh, policymakers. They're easy to understand and they're, they're very informative. Right now, they're working on the sixth assessment, which was due to come out in 21, or 2021 and 22, which I was looking forward to uh, in a big way, but I, it's just been delayed with the response to the COVID-19 um, response. So hopefully that picks up again soon. Biodiversity, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity was agreed upon by multiple nations in 1993. And that was uh, around the time when I was starting my career. So in 1992, I attended a biodiversity conference in the heady days of um, being able to have an opportunity to really manage resources or um, manage resources sustainably and to, um, to be stewards of ecosystems. So that was our living legacy uh, comp conference. I think maybe some of the people here had been to it. I know Pojars were there and, and others, foxes. And it was an incredible time. And that was my first real uh, glimpse into biodiversity and people were excited. So that was in 2002 or three, that conference. The intergovernmental uh, panel on climate or uh, the intergovernmental science policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services is the sister platform to the climate change, the intergovernmental panel on climate change. It wasn't founded in 2000 until 2012 and 2013. And, uh, and the United Nations declared the decade on biodiversity in 2011 to go until uh, 2020. So this is the first big push to start dealing with biodiversity. And there are many experts who think that the issue of biodiversity is much more serious and pressing than the issue of climate change, although both of them are arguably um, crisis problems that we need to, to get a handle on. So in 2018, they were able to do their first regional assessment for the Americas in uh, just quite recently. We should, uh, ideally, we should have had these things uh, a long time ago and a global assessment in 2019. But we have those now. And we also have them working on a transformative change assessment so that, to help us move into transformation of our, our human systems to deal with loss of biodiversity. And that's a three-year endeavor, and that also has been put on hold with COVID. So we have a lot of complex problems, and I just want to say it's not about just about climate change. It's about loss of biodiversity, climate change, COVID-19, and other things. And all of these problems are complex, they're interconnected, and they're multi-scale. So they affect us locally, regionally, nationally, and globally. The good news is that the United Nations uh, um, came up with their 2015-17 sustain goals for sustainable development in their adoption of the 2030 uh, agenda for sustainable development. So we have 17 goals now that we can be working towards to uh, be more sustainable on a, on a planetary scale all the way down to a local scale. So it's a good start. I just was recently reading some papers that I don't have citations for here, but there are calls to, um, to, I guess, revisit or revise these goals in the sense of including more uh, aspects of indigenous interests and values, and also um, to look at it more from a another angle, which is to have social systems within. Uh, um, no, sorry, have economic systems within social systems within a planetary system. So to make the economy uh, a piece of our planetary system, not the be all and end all of how our planetary system is um, functioning from a, a social perspective. Uh, 
So another piece of good news that I discovered, I think, when we were resting in Quito, um, Ecuador, was a book that I read in about, I don't know, in like in at the course of a day, or actually I might have stayed up all night and read it when I started reading it. But it's Kate Raworth's Donut Economics, Seven Ways to Think Like a, a 21st Century Economist. And she takes the United Nations goals and puts them in the center of what she calls a donut and the planetary boundaries and puts them on the outside. And what she's asking people to do is to, to function economically and, and, or, and, and socially as in the safe and just space for humanity. So try not to exceed our planetary boundaries while bringing everybody up to a social foundation that is fair and equitable. So if you haven't read that book, it's a great book and it's getting some purchase in national levels, particularly in Europe, maybe not so much at a international level yet. Uh, social, so I'll just talk a little bit about social ecological systems because I wanna talk about um, how I think and how I'm functioning in this time of great change. And societies and ecosystems are intertwined from local to global scales, making them social ecological systems. This is just a concept and people have defined it in many different ways. And if you look at the re recent re literature, they're really moving quickly on honing in on what it is that they mean when they talk about these things. But I'll just give you a broad definition um, from 2016, from one of the early um, people working on this. Um, the social refers to the human dimension, including economic, political, technological, and cultural, and the ecological, to the thin air of planet Earth, where there is life, the biosphere. Okay, so we're talking about thinking about the Earth system as a whole. Social ecological resilience is the capacity to adapt or transform in the face of change in social ecological systems, particularly unexpected change in ways that continue to support human well-being. So these systems are intertwined, and I think that's the most important part. And this is the part that our model of development, the one that I saw throughout the Americas, is that social and ecological systems are being disconnected. So a big theme for me rolling through my head as I rolled down the highway was disconnect. Disconnect. There are some more things to disconnect us from our ecological systems than there are to connect us. So humans operate in a legacy of social ecological interplay, directly or indirectly, consciously or unconsciously, shaping the capacity of the biosphere and our, our options and our opportunities for a development. In our current model of development, we're totally missing that opportunity. Sustainability. It requires improved stewardship of human actions in concert with the biosphere from the local to the global and across scales because the capacity of the biosphere serves as the foundation upon which the success of future rests. Stewardship, in general terms, <laughs> is the careful and responsible management that you're responsible to care for. These people are talking about it in the context of caring for it, for ourselves, for other people who live, share this planet with us, and for future generations. So just a bit about learning to live with change. This is what we're doing. All of humanity now is coming to a point where we have to learn with, to live with change. Hence, improvised, biosphere stewardship and the Anthropocene is not a top-down global approach enforced on people or solely a bottom-up approach. It's a process engaging people to collaborate across scale levels and scales and with shared visions and certainty and creativity framed by proper institutions, continuously learning and gaining experience and building capacity to live, change and adapt and transform. This is where we need to get to. So, um, you might be able to tell in my voice, this is a hard thing for me to talk about. And uh, when I was asked to give this presentation, Don, um, 
I'm sorry. She asked me to present about Bear Smart Communities because I've done some of this with her in the past in uh, Bear Smart Community or the Telqua. And Bear Smart Communities is something that I got involved in in 2002, writing the background report for how we would become Bear Smart. And it was never rolled out in the way that it was intended, and it was never uh, managed or it was never monitored and adapted in the way that was attended. Um, so I think me and a lot of people that are working, professionals that are working on solving these problems, are some of us are struggling. And we need to find a way of adapting, coping with and adapting to change. There's a lot that we know, and there's a lot that we work with, uh, that we're powerless, or not powerless, they're, they're out of our realm of influence. And um, only now, I, I'm starting to see more of it available on the internet, but people, if there's an emotional toll, and the professional um, AGU, the American uh, Geophysical Union, actually has a, a website. Then they talk about the emotional toll and they talk about how they're losing Earth system scientists because they can't do it anymore. And there's another website called Is This How You Feel? And it's climate scientists actually talking about how they feel um, doing their work and knowing that the planet or humanity is not rising to the challenge quickly or fast enough. And the American uh, Psychology, Psychological Society um, for Climate Change is actually um, putting out resources to help people, not just professionals, but also the public deal with some hard realities. Uh, so the bike trip was, was good. And I came home feeling a bit fragile, but also a lot more resilient. And when COVID-19 got piled on top of it, uh, I think like a lot of us, we got hit um, in our, mm, our uh, offer, knocked off balance, I'd say. So my first response was to start growing food. I really feel strongly that we need to get some food security and I grew up gardening and I think it's a great way to connect with um, my backyard and with ecosystems and yeah for me it was a healthy thing to do and i also got really immersed in connecting myself more solidly with nature so as we were all being pushed into bubbles i got out for walks and i've been monitoring my bat box which i actually have been reading about it is not up to bat species bat community program standards so i need to revise that or make a new one and I've been, you know, putting in flowers and, and encouraging wildflowers so that bees and other pollinators, uh, butterflies can, can get into them. And I'm just really trying to connect with my backyard in the way that I'd like to see the rest of the world connect with their backyard. Which it brings me to coexisting with wildlife and what um, Dawn asked me to talk about, and I've been doing that for a long time, 20 years. I have not had any bear problems living and working with bears uh, in bear country. So I would talk a little just a bit about what I do, and I have a deer and moose also coming into my backyard, so I'm, I'm getting a little bit of expertise with those guys, but my, my, my really solid expertise is bears. I decided that my garden had to be bear, moose, and deer proof because there's no point in me trying to um, battle with them. Uh, they come through our yard, the wildlife trail comes up into our yard. And so I did that and I planted some Hascap berries so it's in the works to put an electric fence around it. And I always compost really diligently. And if, um, you know, I'm putting in a lot of, of things at times that bears are around, sometimes I'll put an electric fence around it. I have a bear proof garbage can that I got a retrofit for if anybody's interested in to make my um, garbage uh, can bear resistant. And I take my bird feeders down at times when bears are around, but when they're not around, I actually have a kind of a cool cable system that it goes high up 14 feet above the ground and 14 feet um, between the lines so the bears can't get at it. And that tree that you see in the background actually is not as close as it looks. 
so yeah, I've managed to, to coexist with the wildlife and I've given lots and lots of presentations about coexisting with wildlife, but we still struggle in all our Northern communities and actually most communities in British Columbia. And fruit trees. Um, I love my little crab apples. So in the fall, I put an electric fence around it. So electric fences are a way to um, uh, prevent bears from getting into all sorts of things. People are getting into backyard uh, chickens and rabbits and beehives now. And I hope that um, we'll start seeing more people using electric fences to keep them out as long as they're properly designed and um, installed and maintained for the attractant that you're putting in. There's many different styles of fences. You can uh, keep bears out of pretty much everything. And fish and game, those uh, require uh, special handling and, and you can have things like electric fences that you use for, for um, storing them or hanging meat in a secure bed, um, shed and things like that. So I am available in the community for anybody that's interested in figuring out solutions to their own particular problems around their yard. And I'll just quickly go through my lessons from my bicycle trip, which are valuable lessons for um, my work and my personal life. Uh, choose a goal, like where do you want to get to? And for me, it will always be important to get towards better stewardship of ecosystems, better problem solving for sustainable development of natural resources. I can't let that go. Aim for it. So that's where I am. I'm pointing at it. I pointed at Ushuaia. You can't plan on how you're going to get there, and you won't know. Um, you won't know all the stops along the way to to deal with climate change or biodiversity or get to Ushuaia. You just have to aim at where you're going, and take the step first step. So for me to go on this bike trip, the hardest part was getting out the door by far. And keep moving. There'll be lots of times when you feel like you've been knocked down, which I have been. Um, just get up and keep going again. Embrace uncertainty. We all need to learn with, uh, to live with uncertainty. And adversity and serendipity go hand in hand. And I think this is really important for dealing with COVID, climate change, loss of biodiversity, or getting to Ushuaia. Um, when bad things happen, you start looking like new opportunities almost always open up and many many times on our bicycle trip we had bad things happen and i'm so glad they did because the serendipity that came along after was super uh, welcomed trust in the goodness of humanity people helped us all along our bicycle trip and even in the most dangerous areas and in the hardest of situations there was always someone there that would reach out to help us connect, reflect, and change perspective. So riding my bicycle actually really turned my head and my perspective totally upside down to the point where I was looking at the stars in the Southern Hemisphere and they were upside down. And um, yeah, just, it's a good thing to do. So if you can find a way of doing something that changes your perspective of what you're trying to do, then do that and find what keeps you going and work with it. So for me, it's absolutely my connection to nature and my curiosity um, that keeps me going. And there'll be ups and downs, lots of them. And uh, we just have to deal with that and don't give up. So my lessons from getting home, um, connection to people and nature and place are all super important. Like I realized that from the day I left home till I got back home. And we're unbelievably lucky to live here, be going through these situations on this planet, um, in this space. Like we have a, a lot uh, to be grateful for. And solutions away and actions that make and restore ecological connections. So I loaned Chris, Kevin, this book. Um, it's uh, called, where is it? A policy process for natural resource management. Don't, yeah, I can't see me, but I think you can see it. Uh, it's a po practical guide for not natural resource professionals. That's kind of what got me started on looking at pro these problems a little bit differently. Um, a few actions for better problem solving. This is my professional opinion. Embrace complexity and uh, uncertainty. 
connect with science to society and to policy. We've got disconnects. Integrative problem solving. We need to be interdisciplinary and we need to be transdisciplinary. We need to like reach way out of our comfort zone. And we need to be using multiple methods at trying to figure these things out. We need to use systems thinking. We can't think of systems as parts of a machine. We need to think of it as a system where you have components of your system and you have relationships between those. So the relationship between our society and our ecological systems. Uh, and we need to transform human systems. Absolutely. It's not tweaking or adapting. They need to be transformed. And we need economy within society, within ecosystems. It can't be any other way. A few more actions uh, for a more ecologically and socially resilient community. This is my personal opinion, is that nature-focused activities are going to be really helpful in these times. And school and community and home gardens are going to be really helpful. And active transfer, transportation. And I wonder, can we harness some of these energy to lever transformations? And um, we can only start with ourselves. That's our zone of influence. Um, we might have a little more influence on our family, a little bit um, less maybe on our community and, and, and so on. So we're talking about transforming at all levels. So resilience helps communities, families, community or individuals, families and communities and ecosystems a cope and adapt to change. Transforming where necessary, and it's necessary. And connecting with nature helps to keep us together, particularly when we're social distan dis distancing keeps us apart. And um, we can connect outside in lots of different ways. And I see people that are doing it while maintaining their, their, their social bubbles. So I'll end this um, with talking about the Bulkley Valley Research Center, whose purpose is to provide science required for sustainable resource management. And I'll remind us once again that this research center emerged from a crisis, and it was from the change of government in 2002, when our worlds were turned upside down as consultants and natural resource professionals. Um, um, losing budgets for research and things like that. And this is what came from it. And I see lots of other positive, positive things happening in the community like the Smithers Climate Action Network and Cycle 16. They're innumerable. So what I wanted to do is open the, or let people ask some questions, but what I really want to do is have a bit of discussion with you about um, what kinds of socially and ecologically connected, act, connected actions are you aware of or do you think might help us to um, break ourselves out of this, oops, this next slide, which is a theme that I saw on my entire bicycle trip. Um, this, so this is what people are being fed in advertising and elsewhere and it says accelerating next the future belongs to the fast and to help you accelerate we created a new company one totally focused on what's next for your organization it's wrong it's not a good story but it's the story that we're being told about development and it's time for a new story and that story to me is that we're evolving always and that the future belongs to the persistent, the resilient, and the adaptable. Life on Earth has evolved this way and it will continue to evolve this way. Um, yeah, so with that, I've been talking to a blank computer and uh, I can feel you guys out there and I want you to, um, yeah, tell me what you think about how, what we can do in the BV Research Center or through it or what kinds of research might help improve the resilience of our community, first for our community, and then we can go from there. Thank you. <laughs>